Okay, we've got a few. Do you want to just give a brief rundown of what we're doing today? I'll give yeah. you a map. So today, um, just pull out the map while I'm talking about it. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the protected areas in the central highlands of Sri Lanka, which itself was actually declared in 2010 as a UNESCO World Heritage Property, a collective natural world heritage property. So in that sense, what it means is that this property as such consists of three serial component parts, uh, which would namely be Horton Plains National Park, the Peak Wilderness Wildlife Sanctuary, and the Knuckles Conservation Forest. Uh, but aside from those protected areas, as you can see on the map here for the Central Highlands, there are a lot more protected areas in the Central Highlands. However, and unfortunately, much like the lowland wet zone, those protected areas are significantly smaller in size than their dry zone counterparts. Uh, but yeah, we will you can that. see that when you look at the map, there's this one big block here, and then this big block here, which is Horton Plains, Peak Wilderness, then Victoria Randhanigala, and the Knuckles up here. Which and then there's a slightly bigger blocks in this area. And then there's a slightly smaller block, which we add on to that near Norelia town, which is the Pidura Talagala Conservation Forest, uh, which is Department of Forest Conservation. So re realistically speaking, there isn't much in terms of size when comparing to dry zone protected areas. But at the same time, it's still enough to warrant the critical watershed protections and general biodiversity conservation that is needed in the central highlands. Yeah. And while you said they're smaller in size comparison to some of the east coast and southern protected areas that we were talking about earlier, that doesn't mean there isn't a lack of biodiversity. There is still Absolutely not. rich no. biodiversity and probably even more in terms of bird life and all of that in the central highlands, which Sri Lankan central highlands is known for. Yeah. And I think it's also critical for everybody who's tuning in today to understand that in general, biodiversity whether its flora or fauna in the wet zone is usually about 100 to 200 times if not more in general in the wet zone and the dry zone and this is very much the case even in the central highlands there are certain differences that get a little technical if you go into them if you want to differentiate between the central highlands and the lowland wet zone but for the most part just keep in mind that that biodiversity is at a significantly higher level than in the dry zone also, to mention that the fact there's only two national parks and one is a well-known Horton Plains. Yeah. And the other one being the Galways, which is probably less known amongst environmentalists and everyone listening in. as It is a small national park that is found really actually within the Nuerelia town. And it is not spoken about and no one really visits it almost. I probably if, if, uh, put it out as a question for the viewers. Anyone here had heard of the Galways National Park before and maybe been there or visited? I would say hardly anyone would. What would you say on that? The fact that there's a national park within Norelia town and no one really knows about it. I think it's one of those cases where there needs to certainly be a lot more done to educate people on what is in the vicinity of Norelia town. I mean, there are multiple protected areas that surround the town. Uh, as well as Galway's land and uh, the Lake Gregory Environmental Protection Area as well. But what I will say is, if there are any birders in the chat who really enjoy birding, a lot of montane endemics are actually found in Galway's Land National Park. And fun fact, uh, the Field Ornithology Group of Sri Lanka, or FOGSL, actually identified uh, Galway's Land National Park and Victoria Park in New Aurelia. Victoria Park is more just an urban park, as among the two best sites in the Central Highlands for birding. So while it's not a big national park by any means, that ecological diversity is still there. And even as we mentioned previously, much like Horrible, a national park in the lowland wet zone, you still get barking deer, mouse deer, porcupine. Some have even speculated that there are pangolins still living. So it's fairly important, I would say, in that regard. All right. So in addition to that, the, when you do look at this map, the first thing you'd see is the fact that you get this big area here and this. But however, within, when you look at it, it looks almost empty. That's because of the high development of tea. And our yeah. central hills are known for the big export from our country, which is tea. And that's how these protected areas, they have turned into the ridges. Because all the lower lands and the lower tiers have been developed for tea. And then it's the higher ridges that become the protected areas because there isn't any development happening on those areas. And that's why you see this pattern. And that is actually the ridge that forms all of these. 
and it's the higher elevation. So Rian, if we were to talk about one of the most prevalent aspects of the Central Highlands, that would be the human leopard conflict at the moment, which is still ongoing. Yeah. You've done some well, serious the work. The best in the example Central would be the two cases that happened recently, and yeah. everyone would have heard about it while this lockdown period was in effect. So what would you say is the most critical component of this human leopard conflict, especially with relation to the peak wilderness wildlife sanctuary, given the size of that wildlife sanctuary? Well, the big factors are the fact that there is a lack of knowledge when it comes to the interaction between the humans and leopards. And there is just so much development and the leopards' habitats cross paths with the humans. So that's basically what's happening. And in the research that was done up in the hills, we were finding how nocturnal the leopards have become. I mean, I was there for six months and I didn't come across a single leopard. That just shows how good they are at avoiding us. And we went out there looking for leopards. So it's very rare cases. And they've found a way to just live during the daytime within these ridges and then filter out into the tea in the night and they only use the night time when everyone goes away from the tea fields to their houses and to the line rooms. That's when they start to travel out. And they so, become extremely well adapted to that habitat. So would you say that the majority of the leopards that you cited, whether on camera traps or have got physical evidence of, were leopards that had actually exited peak wilderness and were actually roaming the tea fields that are in the vicinity of peak wilderness? That's, that's the interesting fact that... It wasn't only from peak wilderness. It was even right. from these little ridges within the tea estates that they'd created a home. And they were. And what we found was that there was a bigger, uh, what would it be, a bigger habitat and bigger territory for all the leopards because of the fact that, that it's disrupted and they can't have like in Yala or Wilpatu, they have a triangular block or they move across. Here they have to move from one place and then rest during the day. So their movements were much larger is what we found in these areas. So that was what was happening. So they weren't just coming down from the peak wilderness, but even these small patches, which they used to rest during the day. And they would move across much further than recognized in Wilpatu and Yal. And that's what was found in these areas. And how did and that, time... that, yeah. I would say that was, that's another reason the conflict comes about because of the fact that they're moving in much larger distances and they come across more humans in that. So how would this tie in then to the research that was done in Horton Plains National Park as well? What would it tell you about the overall distribution of montane leopards in the Central Highlands? And that's, the, that's where the interesting fact comes in. There is so much research done, but lots of this happens on camera trap, meaning you hardly hear people who have photographic evidence or have come across leopards. It's a very lucky instance. I know a few people who have, and recently there were the photos of those leopards at Blackpool. Mm. and all of that but it's such a rare instance but there's so many leopards and the density actually turned out to be impressive and not what we expected initially the study was done to try and identify presence but in the end density studies were able to be done in these areas interesting so it means that for example if we looked at the protected areas in the central highlands in the vicinity of new Aurelia town such as me pilimana conical hill kikilimana the hakala proposed reserve that surrounds the existing strict nature reserve the nanuoya proposed reserve does that mean that we should be pushing the department of forest conservation to finally gather these protected areas or should we be working more towards a community-based aspect or is it a combination of both what do you think I would say in Sri Lanka, the fact is, it does have to become a combination of both. Sure, yeah. Because no matter what, I think community involvement does become a big factor, and especially in these areas, because it is the people's livelihood, and the tea becomes very important. So it is finding that balance again. Yeah. And just those ridges, the importance of them for movement of wildlife and biodiversity, is one of the key aspects, I would say, in the Central Islands. So finding a way of that extra protection. As you know, the Bhogavantalava is one of the proposed reserves. Yeah. And just getting things like that pushed forward and trying to enhance that protection and increasing that connectivity along these reaches is probably an important factor that us as conservationists have to strive for. Which ties nicely, I suppose, to the fact that Horton Plains was initially identified as one of the most critical areas for high leopard densities, I suppose in this case, specifically for montane leopards. But 
many people won't actually be aware that Horton Plains National Park is actually surrounded on all sides by Department of Forest Conservation protected areas existing and proposed. So I guess it comes down to the leopard densities that could be in these Department of Forest Conservation protected areas and what research is needed to show how important these con critical connections actually are. Yeah, definitely. And that research factor is very important. And currently with all the lockdown, none of that can happen. But it, like you hear in the news, all these snares and all of that. So all the illegal activities that are happening are becoming a hindrance. And you're hearing more and more news of barking deer, but they don't come up as much as the leopard because the leopard becoming a big talked about aspect when it does happen. But there's all the other stuff, wild boar, Parking deer, well, the samba, Horton Plains is known for its samba populations. Yeah. And all the animals that are getting disrupted due to our human activity. So it's also finding the control. While the protect, protected areas are very important, it's controlling how the humans act around those protected areas because there is a lot of development in this area as well. So then I suppose this also ties into another question I was going to ask. While you were engaging in this leopard research, now, there's a very little known fact that in the wet zone, we have, a very few, we have very few wild elephants remaining, specifically two subpopulations. One is in the lowland wet zone in the Singaraja National Forest Reserve, and the other one is a 30 to 35 strong, approximately, subpopulation in the Central Highlands, specifically in peak wilderness, in that wildlife sanctuary. Did you have any indirect evidence of their presence when you were working or not? Yes, there was a lot of evidence because it's actually on the edge of peak wilderness where peak wilderness does meet Lakshapana, which is lower on. Yeah. yeah, I can show it up on the map. So that would be in the vicinity so of Erasmus, Giri will, Malay it's and... more towards yeah. going down this way. Yeah. So in these areas, there was a high factor. We did get elephants on camera traps and there was dung and you could see where they walked because the elephants do leave a trail. So there is definitely a lot of evidence and there is that need for protection, especially for elephants. And the fact that they can live in an area like that just proves so, how so that means, they can be. So that means the elephants' migratory routes, at least for this specific population of montane elephants, seems to take them from peak wilderness itself, slightly further down to Bambarabutu, which is a national reserve forest, and Arachna and Gilimale, which is a proposed reserve, and then back up, which creates an interesting triangle for future montane elephant conservation, I guess. Definitely. And see, that in itself shows how these animals have adapted to avoid humans because you hardly hear any reports of these, this herd that does move through. And it's obvious that they are moving through, but you hear no reports. So that in itself shows that these animals try to avoid us, but right. the conflict is caused maybe by that lack of awareness of how we deal with them when we do come across them. Because they, they do their best to avoid us. And that has been happening. And it's these rare instances which unfortunately bring out the sad news of the so conflict. So then, in your opinion, does a similar theory apply to the examples of big wildlife like Victoria Ram, the Nigel Ram, big 400... Sorry. Yeah, a big 436 square kilometer protected area that very few people are aware or talk about. Do you think it's similar in that regard that these examples of wildlife have just learned to avoid humans based on the amount of damage? What would you say? Uh, on that, I would say, yes, they have found a way because of the level of damage that is occurring. And they found a way, like, like I said, those ridges create that protection for them. They've, so they found a way to stick onto the outskirts of these, well, protected areas and forest ridges that are created from the lack of development happening on the ridge. So they use that as cover and then maybe in the nights they do filter down, like I said earlier. So that is yeah. what's happening and they figured out a way how to avoid humans. And Which is interesting humans. because Victoria Randhanigla Rantambe, for those who aren't aware, is actually our largest terrestrial wildlife sanctuary and until very recently it was our largest wildlife sanctuary overall. And even in Victoria Randhanigla Ranthambe, there's still evidence of intermediate zone elephants, leopards, and even sloth bear to a limited extent, actually climbing up from the protected areas in the eastern intermediate zone into Victoria Randhanigla Ranthambe and then going back and forth. 
So I guess it brings up an element of crucial wildlife conservation, especially since Victoria, Ramdeniga, Ramtambay isn't upper montane and montane, but it's montane forest and intermediate zone forest, which is a very poorly studied aspect, I would say. And I'm sure you would agree with that as well. Yes, definitely. And that, that is another factor. The East and maybe the Central Highlands, the amount of studies that do go in, people do tend to focus on Yala and Vilpattu because of the fact that there is visitation happening and people want to know more about. But these places are as important and there isn't as much study happening, which is something we need to promote as well. The importance of st because these are places that while there isn't the visitation happening, all this illegal activity does happen because of that. And the lack of knowledge does create that because if we don't know about it, anything can be done. So that sort of mindset is what we need to get out of and well, to into the future, do more research and come up with ways of connecting. Because like you said, from the East Coast, moving into Victoria, bears, elephant. So just finding that link, because when you do look at it on a map, you almost don't see any connection here. Yeah. But the fact that they're able to move through, even with the small amount of protection that they are being given, just shows how adaptable they are as such. Which is remarkable because it also means that there is quite a scope for reforestation and rejuvenation activities, even yes. within Victoria yes. Randenigla. And, you know, we talked about community based aspects earlier. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to our friends at the Forest Healing Foundation who are actually doing limited community based reforestation work just on the edge of Victoria Randenigla Randenigla. In this case, they're on the western edge towards Candy. But it raises an interesting point that if we were to work at full on reforestation, and the reintroduction of critical species into such protected areas that have been you know, effectively rendered void of said species, we can actually look at completely reversing the downward trend of ecological destruction. And that would really help you know, move us towards significant, and I mean significant conservation efforts in the future, which again, I'm sure you would agree with. Yes, reforestation is one of the big contributors to helping in protected areas and helping areas around these protected areas, like you did mention just before. And yes, it is one of the important factors because it creates that, well, you're creating a habitat and what you're doing is you're also, you can get community involvement through that. So you're getting people around those areas to help and through that you can educate them and get them more involved. And then when someone does something, they seem to care about it a bit more because exactly. it's something they've done. And that in itself creates a conservation aspect. And tied into that, we have our friends at the Parrotfish Collective asking, what's a concrete next step towards that? Well, I think a significant step towards that would be bringing national environmental organizations together in a coalition, which the Parrotfish Collective has actually been, oh, well, friends of the Parrotfish Collective have actually been helping work towards. And in that regard, we can look at actually bringing about the, a coalition that allows for proper reforestation efforts that are coordinated towards protecting the central highlands because and i emphasize and stress on this the majority of the major rivers on this island for those who aren't aware start in the central highlands the mahaveli the walavet the kalu the kelani all these big rivers start in the central highlands they start from various tributary streams and oyas but the baseline area is that if we lose what little protected areas we have in the central highlands we will lose our rivers which you know as you and I both know, would be a complete disaster. Yeah, that's a massive disaster. And yeah, that's probably where the initiative does have to come. And like you said, working together is very important. And that is probably one of the big steps of getting everyone to come together and work towards a common goal as we've been talking about in previous live streams. Uh, yeah, so that is an important fact. And thanks for the question. So then okay. if we were to move further north, now the Knuckles Conservation Forest has been identified as one of the floristically richest areas in Sri Lanka, especially in the wet zone after the Kamnelia, Dediagla, Nakia, Denia or KDN forest complex. So what would your experiences be in the Knuckles from what you have seen? Well, from what I've seen, the Knuckles is because of the fact that it has been declared as a conservation forest. It does get that extra bit of protection that it needs and I think we did talk about it in our first session where that creates that level of protection and that level of extra protection is something 
forest, pristine forest like the Nakals does need. And yes. it is our duty when we do go and visit places like this, not to leave behind a trail as such that leads to this destruction. And it's just our responsibility, our, us being responsible citizens as such and doing things in a sustainable way, even around these areas, because all the activities happening around do have ways of leading into this and can in the end destroy. And we yeah. do have another question. Policy reform, the reforestation policy. Do you want to... Policy reforms in Sri Lanka are probably a massive subject and you can talk about it for days and it is definitely needed in Sri Lanka, the reform in policy and reforestation. So that is something we do need to talk about and something we need to work on. And again, I think it's that getting communities together and working towards that goal of, because through reforestation, we can improve conservation goals, if you agree with that. Yes, absolutely. And I would say to add to the second part of that question, our policies issue or implementation. Unfortunately, it seems that despite the fact that for example, now a lot of these protected areas that we've talked about, I would say maybe 70% or more actually under the Department of Forest Conservation as opposed to any other conservation-oriented government entity. So the Department of Forest Conservation, their secondary mandate or one of their secondary mandates at the moment is to actually remove the initial old plantation forests that were planted in what are now montane protected areas and reforest them according to the specifications as designated by the different uh, forest types. But unfortunately, what has happened is they are taking too long because they haven't found a viable way to implement these reforestation programs. And as a result, we are still seeing problems in montane protected areas due to the lack of reforestation that I talked about earlier. So there is an implementation issue as well, aside from the policy aspect. Uh, yeah, so there's the, that question. The second part was, are the policies the issue or the implementation? And for... Sri Lanka, I would say implementation is one of the key issues because while the policies put together are probably sound and all of that, how we implement it and how our people react to these policies are different because environmental conservation is not a big subject as such in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, and that's where the education, educating our younger generations into the need for conservation and need for environment and wildlife towards the future because it's such a big even economically, our wildlife and conservation is one of our key factors for tourism. And just educating our younger generations, I think, is an important factor. Because I think most of the policies put together go through all the research process and how it needs to be done. And all of that is done correctly and viably. But then the implementation and getting it to our government and how it's done is also an issue and where we need to work on and how we can better these things. So those connections there. Plus the fact that, you know, from a multi-stakeholder standpoint, in Sri Lanka, we need multi-stakeholder based plans for protected areas. Now, I was actually going to just quickly draw on uh, Dunamadalava, which is a national forest reserve under the Kandy Municipal Council. It was actually handed over to the Kandy Municipal Council to facilitate the protection of the watershed for the city of Kandy, because the city of Kandy gets a significant percentage of its water supply, its clean drinking and general fresh water supply from the Darwin Reservoir, inside Dunamudalawa. And that ties in nicely to the fact that between Dunamudalawa and the neighboring Hamtana Environmental Protection Area, which is under the CEA, there are still leopards running around in the vicinity of Kandy City. So there definitely has to be a multi-stakeholder based consultation for a lot of these uh, protected areas, especially for their management. But at the same time, I think it has to be only the government entities that are considered necessary. You can't have 150 stakeholders yep. getting involved, then it becomes a nightmare. I mean, you and I both know that. Yeah, that's exactly where stakeholders are important. No matter how many there are, the stakeholder consideration is probably very important, but filtering out and taking out and putting in the important ones and stacking them in terms of importance and then picking out probably the top 10. And most of them top 10 would be the government entities because they're the ones in charge at the end. So like that, yeah. And just having the stakeholders involved, but maybe not in decision making as such. Because you can't have, like you said, everyone in world. That just messes up everything. In Well, too many cooks spoil the soup as such. Yeah, absolutely. And even from a, you know, an awareness standpoint, I don't know whether many people are aware, but there is actually one last 
remaining intermediate zone forest connection between the dry zone and the wet zone, and that would be the Laggala Pallegama proposed reserve, or alternatively, as it's sometimes known, the Vehirgala land bridge. And that actually connects uh, Wasagamu National Park in the dry zone to the Knuckles Conservation Forest in the wet zone. And what's important about right. it, as I said earlier, yeah, from an awareness map. standpoint, yeah, just bring it up on the map, roughly where it would be. So between Wasagamu and Knuckles, there is almost a straight land bridge connection. And one of the reasons why when we say from an awareness standpoint that that must be protected is that a lot of that forested land was actually lost to the recent Morogaha Kanda Kaluganga Agricultural uh, Reservoir Project. So we need to seriously rethink our priorities. Yes, development and agriculture are needed for the island to a certain extent, but we can't be sacrificing hundreds of thousands of acres of forest. Otherwise, we are just you know, shooting ourselves in the foot, as it were, when it comes to environmental conservation. Definitely. 100% agree on that. And like you said, that is where that is a proposed reserve. So that is where even like I was saying earlier, these proposals, you need yeah. the backing and being able to push it through. Sometimes these proposals, until they're pushed through, there isn't enough protection. And that's when things can get destroyed. And our protected areas do suffer due to this. So getting those gadgets confirmed and all of that is where it becomes extremely important. And that is where awareness and getting back in to put these proposals through do come into effect. Because it's, 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 it's odd if you think about it, you know, under the Flora and Fauna Protection Ordinance, the Forest Conservation Ordinance and the National Environmental Act, we actually have some of the most stringent laws that any country could have for the protection of our protected areas overall. Yes, there are a couple of loopholes that might allow for certain activities to take place that might, might not be conducive, but for the most part, we have the laws in place. But as I said earlier, implementing it is another big aspect that we have to properly address. Implementation is where I think a lot of the focus needs to come into. Because like I said earlier, the research is all done and all of that is put forward. But just that implementation factor, we need to really work on that. And getting our government more involved and showing them the importance of wildlife and nature protection is key. And I just wanted to touch on something very briefly that I found quite interesting. I think some in the audience will find it as well. So I'm sure a lot of you would be aware that strict nature reserves under the Department of Wildlife Conservation are the highest tier protected area available for wildlife conservation under the DWC. The odd thing is the conservation forest is actually technically that equivalent under the Department of Forest Conservation. So legally speaking, you shouldn't actually be allowed to enter into a conservation forest, but under the current iteration of the Forest Conservation Ordinance as of 2009, there are two subsections which actually state that if the top man at the Department of Forest Conservation, that would be the Conservative General, if he decides that a conservation forest should be opened and um, given a management plan for ecotourism and community involvement, then they can. So that is actually one of the reasons why people can actually enter the Knuckles Conservation Forest and go on walking and hiking safari trails due to that loophole. And I think although loopholes are something that won't necessarily go away unless we actually physically come together and actually bring about that change, we can still utilize them. Because remember, the Department of Forest Conservation's primary mandate at the moment is to ensure that there is community-based participation. And as we discussed earlier, that will be a big part in future conservation efforts. I'm sure you would agree with that. Yeah, 100%. And like you said, it's loopholes do occur in most policies and it's just finding a way to be adaptable and coming up with solutions for the loopholes that arise. So that again is in the formulation and management and that comes into after policy is put forward and how you would manage it. So better management and all that like we did touch on in previous sessions. So anyway, I think we've come to the end of the half an hour. And for next week, I think we're moving into the North Central which is we're including Waskamu and Kalavabu and some of the places like that. And we will be talking about uh, North Central province. So. Yeah. So basically those protected area clusters around Waskamu, that tri-pass sector, then you have the Kalavabu forest complex and then the general North Central region, which is a key fundamental area. Again, when it comes to both to watershed conservation from the reservoirs, especially from an agricultural standpoint in the dry zone. And importantly, the conservation of wild elephants as well. That would be a big part of it. But this is where we can really about. talk about the wild elephant conservation and human elephant conflict where it does arise a lot. So yeah, hopefully we see lots of you next week and I'll talk to you also next week.
Yeah. Sounds good. See you next.